Good morning and welcome back to the basement. This is building a loader for a garden tractor, phase five, the result. This will be a detailed walkthrough of the final as-built hydraulic configuration for this loader. This configuration works well for case and Ingersoll machines, but it's probably not a workable approach for most other garden tractors. If you're curious about the evolution of this design, the decision-making process, and the many obstacles I encountered along the way, then please see the companion video to this one, Phase 5, The Story. First, we'll cover the factory hydraulic configuration, and then we'll walk through the modifications made to it. We begin with an Ingersoll 4020 PS with a 20 horsepower engine and power steering. First, we have a 2.5 gallon reservoir, which gravity feeds to an 11.5 gallons per minute pump. The pump's output is connected to a proportional flow divider. The flow divider splits out 2.5 gallons per minute dedicated to the power steering system. The power steering system consists of an orbital power steering valve controlled by input from the steering wheel. The valve is connected to a hydraulic cylinder and that cylinder extends or retracts in order to turn the front wheels. The remaining 9 gallons per minute of oil is directed to the pressure port of the travel control valve. The two-spool travel control valve has two internal circuits, each with their own pressure relief setting. The first circuit controls the tractor's main travel motor, and its pressure relief is set at about 2100 psi. All the flow from the travel circuit, whether it made its way through the motor or not, enters the deck lift circuit. The deck lift circuit controls the deck lift cylinder and its pressure relief is set at about 600 psi. Coming out of the travel control valve's return port, the oil flows first through the oil cooler, a small radiator intended to keep the oil from overheating under heavy load, and then through the oil filter before it makes its way back into the tank. One item of note is that the body of the travel control valve was originally designed to support a power beyond option and was cast at the factory with a heavy boss marked PB. Though this one hasn't been machined to accept a power beyond sleeve, it has been drilled and tapped to receive a standard fitting. And that fitting is now a port leading to the main low pressure return to tank line. The power steering system's return to tank line has been connected to this port and ejects its return oil here, which saved Ingersoll the cost and complexity of installing an additional T somewhere else in the system. Now for the modifications we've made. The first modification is the addition of a three-point hitch and a diverter valve to control it. The three-point hitch is driven by an additional hydraulic cylinder, which was simply teed into the same pressure lines that drive the deck lift. At that point, if you raise the deck lift, the three-point lift went up with it, and vice versa. Then, a three-way diverter valve was installed to direct the pressure flow to either the front or the rear cylinder, so now you can operate both cylinders independently of each other. Next, the travel control valve. The travel control valve was removed, and the original Power Beyond boss has been machined to accept a Power Beyond sleeve. Due to lack of clearance, a custom fitting had to be created, integrating a Power Beyond sleeve into a number 10 SAE swivel fitting. So all the oil flowing through the travel control valve will now be ejected from this Power Beyond port at the same pressure as the deck lift circuit. However, 600 PSI is insufficient for the loader's needs, so the deck lift circuit's pressure relief valve has been eliminated. This has the effect of delivering full flow 2100 PSI to the Power Beyond port, but it threatens to damage the various components of the deck and three-point lift systems. So to address that problem, a new hydraulic component was created, a dual isolated port pressure relief valve with integrated outflow T. The dual ports of this pressure relief device 
are simply teed into the pressure lines of the deck lift system and serve to harmlessly bleed off any pressures in excess of 600. Because it's connected to both the lift and drop lines at the same time, its two ports have been isolated from one another, which prevents oil from bypassing from one line into the other. And, taking a page from Ingersoll's book, this device has two ports in its return to tank cavity, one leading off to the return tank itself, and the other receiving and passing along the return oil from the power steering system. The high pressure output from the power beyond port is routed outboard underneath the right hand footrest and terminates at a quick disconnect at the right side of the tractor. The line itself is standard half inch scheduled 40 steel pipe which has a 5000 psi pressure rating. The fittings though are special purpose 4000 psi high carbon steel fittings. Note that standard iron pipe fittings must never be used in hydraulic pressure lines. Sticking out of the side of the steering tower is the corresponding return to tank line. It's also standard steel pipe, connected into the oil filter at one end and has a permanently attached hydraulic hose at the other. Note that this line is strictly low pressure. At this point in the system, the only possible resistance to flow is that of the oil filter and the oil cooler. These two components will produce a bit of back pressure, but never more than about 50 psi. Due to the low pressure, this return line can utilize standard black iron pipe fittings, which are rated for about 300 psi. Now in this photo, we see these two lines, the pressure feed line on the right and the return to tank line on the left, and they do look very similar but don't be fooled. Remember, with the loader installed, the line on the right has to supply the pressure that drives the loader's cylinders, and it will routinely exceed 2000 psi. But the line on the left merely feeds into the oil filter, and it cannot, under any circumstances, experience more than about 50 psi. That's why standard low pressure fittings are fine for use on the left hand pipe, the return line, but could never be considered for use on the right hand pipe, the pressure line. Note as well that the tractor can never be started without a completed connection between the pressure feed line and the return to tank line. With the return hose disconnected, all the high pressure flow coming out of the travel control valve has no place to go. The engine probably won't even turn over, and if it did start, the travel control circuit's pressure relief valve would have to bypass 100% of the pump's output. No damage is likely, but the tractor won't operate and the system will be under a lot of unnecessary strain. Moving on to the oil filter. In my opinion, the factory oil filter housing was undersized. So to ease oil flow and improve filtration, the oil filter housing and filter were replaced with a higher flow model. The larger oil filter necessitated the reconfiguration of the routing of the return oil in the tower. So the return oil now passes through the oil filter first, then through the oil cooler, and after that back up into the reservoir. This completes all the modifications to the tractor itself, so let's take a look at the loader assembly when it's attached. We bring the loader valve into the pressure stream using two hoses. We disconnect the return to tank hose from the feed line disconnect and connect it instead to the disconnect located at the loader valve's return line. Then the loader valve's feed line is connected to the tractor's feed line. Here we see the loader valve's pressure feed hose, highlighted in green, connected to the pressure feed line disconnect. Then we have the return to tank hose, highlighted in blue, joined to the loader valve's return line disconnect. With both those hoses in place, all the pressurized oil flow will now pass through the loader valve, ready to be directed out to the loader cylinders as needed. The two-spool loader valve itself has two circuits. One lever controls the boom cylinders, the other controls the bucket curl cylinders. The piping from the valve to the cylinders is pretty standard, but there's one detail to cover. 
I initially had planned to connect the cylinders in a daisy chain scheme, whereby for any given pair of cylinder ports, you connect a T to the nearest cylinder port, then pipe directly from the valve to that T, and then pipe from that T across the tractor to the matching cylinder port on the other side. Later on, it occurred to me that that scheme might be problematic. One part of my intuition tells me that the near side port will be subject to higher pressure and that that higher pressure will result in more oil flow to the near side port which will tend to distort the frame of the loader. The other part of my intuition tells me that at pressures above 2000 psi the differing hose length is an insignificant factor. So I'm uncertain if daisy chaining is a viable approach or not. But I chose to go with a center tapped piping approach, which I believe will minimize the frame distortion issue. In a center tapped scheme, a T is located in the center of the loader, and two identical hoses are run from that T out to each pair of cylinder ports. Then the center port of that T is connected back to the loader valve. This ensures an identical fluid path to both sides, which will result in identical oil pressure on both sides and that should minimize, if not eliminate, the frame distortion problem. As you can see in the photo, there are four T's located in the middle of the loader's center support member, one T for each pair of cylinder ports, and each T backfed by a hose leading to the loader valve. Now the downside of this approach is obvious, its relative ungainliness and lack of tidiness. So I did fabricate an aluminum cover plate which serves both to improve the overall appearance and to provide some degree of protection to the hoses underneath. It would be far neater to have run four short hoses from the loader valve to the back of the boom frame and then run hard lines from there down to the center tees. But at the time I ordered these four long hoses I had planned to have the loader valve permanently mounted on the right rear fender. I intended these long hoses to make the run from the rear fender down under the right hand footrest and all the way back up to the rear of the boom. Once I chose to relocate the loader valve, I either had to order four short hoses and install four runs of hard lines or just use these four long hoses and control their mess as best I could. It's not elegant, but it's adequate. And if these four hoses ever need to be replaced, then I'll take the time to do it right then. That's pretty much all there is to it. As always, your comments or questions are welcome. And thanks for watching.